So I'm sure all of you have seen that footage coming out of Ukraine since February 2022 when drones in their UAV and RPA variants were used in kinetic strikes as well as ISR, artillery spotting and of course also switching over then to suicide attacks or kamikaze attacks with loitering munitions. With the conflict of course comes a steady supply of this sort of footage but one of the questions I want to ask really is how come that Ukraine has been able to integrate drones this quickly and this effectively because this is something that sure enough you can learn how to operate a drone especially a small UAV in a matter of days perhaps but really to integrate it into your tactics and integrate it into your operational strategy that takes a little bit more time and especially also some of the more innovative tactics we've seen with experimentation going on on the front line that is not something that it just appears out of nowhere. To answer this question I have invited Dr. Julia Moravska who is an independent defense analyst focusing on defense industry, technology, applications and policy and she has 13 years of experience in this field having previously also worked for RAND Europe and she recently released a piece on exactly this sort of question where does Ukraine's know-how with drones as UAVs but also in terms of RPAs come from what is sort of the defense industry setting there from small actors over to state-sponsored actors and how was this sort of integration with the civilian military connection the synergies that were explored there in terms of sending equipment to the frontline units and then having experience trickle back in order to improve the systems how does that really work well in order to answer those questions let's just jump right into the conversation this conversation on military aviation history is made in cooperation with the freeman air and space institute king's college london so Julia, thanks very much for joining us today. And I thought we'd jump right into this question of UAVs and RPAs in Ukraine. And of course, we've seen a lot of footage coming out of the present conflict with UAVs being used for artillery spotting, surveillance, reconnaissance, and of course, RPAs in the initial phases of the conflict as well for the kinetic application. Is this really this the switch of Ukraine towards using drones in, in the sense of UAVs? Um, really something that results out of the February 22 attack or has this really already emerged out of the conflict that has been resting somewhat dormantly since 2014? Yes, uh, somewhat dormantly, but uh, not uh, not for the for the people who were um, on on the front lines in the Donbass. The use of UAVs by Ukraine does, in fact, date back to Ukraine's fight um, against the Russian-backed uh, separatists in, in the Donbass region. But it is true that it was uh, a lot more limited than, um, than what we're seeing today. For example, already in 2014, 2015, the first kind of volunteer tech-savvy uh, drone hobbyist groups began to emerge. Um, and they started using crowdfunding to actually purchase both um, bigger UAV systems and adapt commercial drones to then uh, deliver them to the Ukrainian armed forces. They also started um, themselves putting together small so-called um, DIY, DIY quadcopters. So those um, you know, small drones with four rotors that you usually see doing, um, doing deliveries. Um, and also they were training Ukrainian soldiers to use them. However, I should say that these types of UAVs and these types of activities were used mostly for uh, ISR purposes, um, which means intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance, meaning to observe and watch enemy targets and movements. If we are talking about using more sophisticated military UAVs, um, or, or drones or RPAs to actually attack and destroy targets, then that came a bit later. In late 2019, I believe, Ukraine actually used the Turkish uh, Bayraktar TB2 drone to strike a Russian um, howitzer, which is a, an artillery system, which the separatist forces were using to shell Ukrainian positions. And this was reportedly the first time that Ukraine used it to destroy a target. And, and, and it was quite a, a notable moment in kind of the pre-February 2022 uh, conflict, um, that kind of uh, attack by Ukraine using, using the uh, Bayraktar. 
Okay. And how do we have to then sort of imagine the UAE tech landscape in Ukraine since 2014? You've mentioned this sort of hobbyist company being set up. Um, is this a state sponsors process? Are these startups, as you say, completely crowdfunded? Uh, do large companies come into the country and start helping with this sort of development? And what's the role sort of of foreign actors there as well? It's all of the above, I have to say. And um, I should also add that for kind of the work that um, I have done on this, I have probably just scratched the surface, you know, of the UAV activities and um, landscape in Ukraine. I think, you know, it definitely merits a much uh, kind of a much closer look to categorize, untangle everything. It's really a fascinating story. What I myself have um, observed is that, as I said, or as you said, there are all of these types of activities. So I will start with... Um, maybe a state-funded example, that is definitely happening. And just, um, I think, over a month ago, Ukra Baron Prom, which is Ukraine's um, state-owned defense conglomerate, uh, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really large and it's kind of Ukraine's premier defense industry, announced that it is in the final stages of developing a long-range strike UAV, and it is hoping to actually hand it over to the Ukrainian armed forces um, by the end of, of this year. There are also smaller companies working on this. Um, one is that I have noted is um, Ukrspet Systems, which has developed a multi-purpose drone for, for ISR purposes. And it's actually the kind of an update or, or a more modernized version of an earlier drone that they developed. And, and you know, they kind of date back to that pre-2022 uh, conflict. There are also a number of startups. Uh, I think those ones have been more kind of uh, prominent in, in the media. Again, I haven't done a systematic search on all the startups, but I have kind of noted two of them that appear to be veteran-owned and veteran-led, which I thought was interesting. And they have come out with reusable strike drones just recently. So that means, you know, unlike the so-called kamikaze drones, they they can uh, hit targets, but, you know, they, they get preserved and they can be used again. They can, they can fly away. And of course, lastly, as you mentioned, there are also foreign systems, so foreign UAVs that have been provided by Ukraine's partners since the fully-fledged invasion and, and war. We already mentioned uh, Bayraktar, which was quite a, a visible feature, especially in the early weeks and months. But what I thought was interesting is that actually CEO of that company that makes Bayraktars in, in Turkey um, announced plans to complete a plant in Ukraine for joint production of the drones in Ukraine within two years. So there's that type of, um, of activity and that type of cooperation happening as well. So it's, it's, it's quite dynamic, quite layered. And how do we sort of have to look at these these companies that are, let's say, veteran owned or that are, that are crowdfunded? What exactly sort of do they provide to the Ukrainian armed forces in terms of the experimentation and you might as well just say are indeed a work that they're doing. They they kind of range in in the, I would say their ambition, uh, or maybe uh, the the sort of spectrum of um, R and D and production that they do. Some of them focus specifically on experimenting with commercial systems and kind of finding ways to to actually adapt. You know, low cost. Um, consumer drones for, for example, um, dropping grenades on enemy targets. Um, I think there was a kind of a clip that circulated fairly widely on social media in, in the early stages of the war where you actually see a um, grenade with what was then analyzed and revealed to be 3D printed fins actually being dropped from an adapted consumer drones. So they do those types of um, those types of activities. Some of the more sophisticated types of activities actually are done by one organization that I um, that I highlighted in my piece for uh, for the Freeman Air and Space Institute. This organization is called Aero Rozvitka, which means um, aerial reconnaissance in in Ukrainian. And based on you know what I have seen, also in other countries, it's it's 
a totally unique um, organization. It also dates back to you know the fight against Russian-backed separatism. It is an NGO and, and it is crowdfunded. It has um, hundreds of members that are IT specialists, engineers, um, software developers, and also many members of the military. So they actually uh, have developed their own drone that can be um, weaponized that actually is designed to be weaponized uh, with a grenade the r18 and they provide that to the ukrainian military even though they did also start kind of by um, experimenting with commercial systems so really it's kind of the full spectrum and um, you know i wouldn't want to say that like i i mean i use the term like sophisticated but that's purely a technical or technological term, you know, I think those, the kind of low cost, initially commercial drones adapted for military use, I mean, they have been hugely helpful for intelligence, for, uh, you know, even coordinating um, troop movements, for helping uh, to provide this high quality picture to the Ukrainian side of what what the, um, the Russians have been doing. So really, it's been a major effort in in the Ukrainian defense. And, and how connected then are these civilian and the military actors in terms of the experimentation and the information transfer and also the experience that comes in using these drones on the front line and that information then being referred back to the civilian development process and then having the changes implemented that are perhaps required? So what I have actually uh, noted while I was looking into this is that um, there's actually quite close you know, an effective, um, and I would say in some instances, deep interlinkage between civilian and um, military actors. So I, I just mentioned the example of Aerorozvitka. As I said, they also have military personnel that are members of this organization. They do. They were initially doing training and still continue to do training for uh, for the military on operating the drones. And you know, these relationships get established, and then quite a close channel of communication develops that then is used for this two-way communication. I have also, again, when, you know, when I've done this, I would say, cursory sort of look, I mean, I, I wish I would have been able to actually go to Ukraine and, and, and speak to all these people, you know, maybe maybe one day. But what um, what I could tell is, um, is that, you know, when these systems are um, are developed or when these UAVs are adapted by by the civilians or the volunteers, there is actually feedback that's coming from the military units about how it's performing, you know, how it has performed in this particular operational setting, um, maybe what uh, there are suggestions for what should be changed, whether it's, you know, kind of about the flight path of the UAV or it's about some of the technical specifications. So all of that, all of that is is happening. I should note, though, that um, it's difficult to tell how systematic it is. Um, I think, you know, by by necessity, it a lot of these efforts are uh, ad, ad hoc. Um, you know, they're kind of improvised because because they have to be, and there is not uh, ample time, <laughs> to put it mildly, to kind of, you know, set up your demonstration or your testing and then where you get to, you know, to, to kind of um, have this uh, optimal environment for, um, for uh, field testing and then observations and then former feedback. So I think all of that, a lot of that is happening, you know, in an ad hoc way and maybe, maybe in pockets. And what sort of cooperation, if we zoom out of this, uh, out of Ukraine right now, what sort of cooperation is happening in this regard between Ukraine and NATO countries regarding UAVs and also sort of the, the benefits perhaps if we want to go into that and the utility of the cooperation for both sides here? I would characterize as the current state of cooperation between um, Ukraine and NATO in this area um, as being mostly about um, the provision of UAVs by individual NATO members. You know, I, I, again, I, I mentioned Bayraktar's. Um, the U.S. has supplied um, so-called kamikaze drones to Ukraine or um, loitering munitions, um, the, the switchblades. Poland has provided reconnaissance drones. Um, U.K. has supplied heavy lift drones, which uh, can transport really heavy cargo to um, to the front lines. NATO as an institution is, uh, of course, attempting to kind of coordinate uh, and um, and uh, facilitate that. So there were also reports that I um, that I picked up uh, that 
for uh, unconfirmed or rather unofficial early um, in the war of um, finished intelligence uh, being shared with Ukraine by the U.S. That is partly coming from drone footage, so from from um, U.S. drone footage. But you know, wh when I say finished intelligence, I mean that it's not uh, you know there's not a video link from from an American drone. Um, kind of pinging the picture directly to um, to uh, the Ukrainian military but rather it's uh, you know it's it's perhaps intelligence that that comes partly from drone footage and you know has been processed and analyzed by the US and then is um, shared with Ukraine that that's just what I saw on um, open source um, uh, information and platforms as far as uh, the utility of cooperation I think actually that is really quiet um, quite a promising area and the the short piece that I published on this is uh, is kind of to to draw attention to all of this creativity ingenuity innovation that is happening in uh, Ukraine in UAVs and and beyond and to kind of highlight the fact that increasing cooperation with with NATO would be beneficial for for both sides I mean wh what do I mean what kind of benefits uh, am I talking about when um, when I say this we talk about uh, drones there are lessons ukraine you know can share about integrating commercial components that's you know it sounds simple but it's actually not into uh, into military systems and kind of you know marrying the consumer technologies and 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 military technologies and making them speak to each other and making them actually be effective um on the on the field a softer maybe aspect of this is also um well, softer, but but no less crucial, is also about involvement and uh, mobilization of um, of civilian skills and the wider civil society in this effort. You know, that's that's kind of perpetually the question that a lot of um, NATO uh, militaries ask themselves. You know, how do we actually leverage uh, all of the innovative activity, all of the skills that are available in the civil sector? Uh, society uh, or in the commercial sector for uh, for defense purposes or for for military purposes so i think you know ukraine could definitely share lessons on that from the nato side um what ukraine would want is is actually support of these types of activities so there are uh, challenges with scaling there are challenges with um increasing you know the the production or the supply to the ukrainian armed um, forces. Uh, there's also, you know, I think a really valuable opportunity to then uh, learn more specifically and more technically about these um, about these systems and, 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 you know, how do you then leverage all of those learnings? Uh, but I think all of that, you know, is um, would need support from uh, from NATO to help Ukraine with that, because it's you know, right now it's it's you can imagine. I mean, it's a wartime environment. So um, it's sort of the all of the focus is on um, is on getting these um, these systems or these UAVs out to the front line. If we were to say, OK, where does Ukraine? I mean, of course, the current situation doesn't help in, in terms of long term planning and, and uh, putting in specific plans in place there. But if we were to say, okay, you, what Ukraine has right now, where can they go from here in terms of UAV technology development? And are, are there sort of any emerging trends there in terms of the unmanned and the robotic systems that are being used? Well, as, as the country and also, you know, the kind of policymakers have repeatedly signaled and flag that they are they are trying to um, to plan ahead despite despite the war and they believe that it's important and what I see is actually Ukraine expanding its um, drone arsenal through both domestic design and production and foreign supplies actually one of the kind of notable examples that I think is going to be uh, really important in in this trajectory is the recent announcement of an agreement between um ukr abaron uh, prom so ukraine's um state-owned uh, defense conglomerate and uh six nato member states on joint production of heavy weaponry and um, other military equipment um and while drones were not explicitly mentioned in this i mean there's not much information about the specifics um as um as you can imagine what was mentioned is the 
development of new high-tech weapons. So you could very well imagine that drones you know, could be part of that category, in which case, you know, you would really see Ukraine significantly expand its uh, drone production and design um, capability. Um, I think, you know, in terms of the wider sort of trends, war looks like it will continue to be a war in which artillery and missile strikes are perhaps, you know, the most prominent in the sense that they do the greatest damage, destruction, and um, they lead to the greatest number of casualties that we see in the in the media. Uh, but drones are likely to play as great of a role as they have in the beginning and, and actually in greater, uh, even a greater role, I think. You know, I see there being a more creative use of drones, um, using them for more complex operations potentially cross domains, both maritime drones, for example, and aerial drones working together to launch an attack. I mean, we saw an example of that, of a, of a combined, you know, maritime and air drone attack on Russia's Black Sea fleet, which technologically, you know, was very advanced. Again, in terms of the overall damage to, to the Russian targets, it, it, it obviously wasn't uh, at the level of a major missile strike. But, you know, I think the for what it meant, for how um, for how wars will be fought, uh, how many drones you can actually uh, make to cooperate and speak together across domains. I think that was a really significant moment. Parallel, you, of course, see a greater focus on counter drone solutions as well. Ukraine is, uh, you know, is, is paying attention to this. There are domestic systems that that have come out, and Ukraine has also, you know, repeatedly requested that counter drone weapons and um, and systems be provided by its allies, mostly in in light of Russian attacks against civilian energy infrastructure in Ukraine with the Iranian-made um, Shahed kamikaze drones or so-called kamikaze drones. Considering all this 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 cooperation that is going on between the civilian and the military side in Ukraine, and then, of course, between Ukraine and NATO. What would you say is perhaps some of the main avenues where you would say, well, this would now help Ukraine um, develop its UAV landscape in more, you know, a cap to increase that capability there? Um, are there any sort of opportunities on the NATO sites that are still unexplored or simply not activated yet? Based on my experience, I think people are probably, um, you know, thinking about this about this already, but what I have not seen and what I would like to see is um, actually Ukraine and um, Ukrainian um, UAV startups be given access to some of the uh, NATO and EU tools and instruments aimed at um, defense innovation. So, for example, NATO has launched the DIANA program, which is an uh, accelerator for um, for defense uh, startups. I think Ukraine and Ukrainian um, startups in robotic and autonomous systems, uh, as well as UAVs, would hugely benefit from access to that because, you know, they um, they have the know-how, they have the skills, they have kind of uh, the operational experience. Um, but um, a lot of them are quite simply lacking in bandwidth. You know, they're lacking in in funding. And when if we think about kind of um, you know their long, medium term or longer term trajectory, um, then then you need to somehow move on from from the sort of war footing, and you need greater institutional support. You know, investment. You need customers. Um, so the specific mechanisms that exist um, already, such as um, Diana, that you know the, the accelerator that I mentioned, would be a great opportunity to help Ukrainian um, Ukrainian startup. There is also on the EU side um, the European Defense Agency. Agency has um, has an EU or has a um, defense innovation hub, which can be used to to help Ukraine kind of understand how to embed defense innovation and um, new defense technologies, including um, robotic and autonomous systems in in sort of, you know, the normal way of doing business in defense, which is which is what you really need. So there there are these, um, you know, the, these mechanisms that already exist, but Ukraine has not been um, has not been a part of uh, because it's, you know, it's it's not a NATO member. It's not an EU member. Yeah, I, I assume and, and pardon my ignorance on this, but I assume that membership in either institution is required in order to benefit from those accelerators? I mean, yes, yes and no, right? I think traditionally, yes. 
Um, but also, you know, Ukraine is a um, has been a, a partner um, within NATO, so it, it's it's member of the Partnership for Peace. It's an enhanced opportunity partner. Um, there are, you know, Ukraine has cooperated on a number of and has been actually, you know, an active participant. I think in all of NATO's peacekeeping uh, operations or military operations. Sorry, um, you know, since since the 1990s, it has partnered with the European Defense Agency as well. So I think, you know. Where there is a will, there is a way, and um, if if the um, uh, the members of those organizations are um, are in favor of of giving Ukraine or Ukrainian startups access, then uh, then it can happen. Um, and also, you know, there are there kind of avenues, right? Like there, I'm sure there are working solutions that can be that can happen. Uh, sort of maybe looking at it at an ad hoc basis or a case by case, you know, uh, program level, project level, where Ukrainian um, startups can join or can um, can participate. In the description, I'm going to be posting your piece on this as well, which I highly recommend everyone to read. But beyond that, do you have any sort of recommendations for people, one or two recommendations where you'd say, go there, read those sources, read those uh, governmental papers, and, um, and, and, and if you want to know more about the subject? Obviously, there are lots of... Um, of materials on uh, on kind of um, UAVs in in the war um, in Russia's war um, against Ukraine, um, uh, the. Royal United Service Institute has um, has tracked this as part of their you know ongoing analysis of the war. Rusi, um, the Stimson Center um, in 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 the U.S. has done this. But if you if we are specifically looking at defense or rather UAV innovation kind of DIY um, drone type of activity, Ukrainian startups, um, civilians working with the military. So some of these more specific topics that we have uh, described uh, with a specific focus on what Ukraine is doing in this area. You know, there is um, there is not much. I have mostly looked at um, international and Ukrainian media sources to, you know, to do the work that um, I have done. Recently, I saw a really good article in The Atlantic by Mark uh, Bowden, and it's actually about where... Um, where is the the use of drones going based on what we can see in um, in the current war, specifically with a focus on kind of swarm technologies and how that could look like and um, how far away are we from from that type of um, scenario. So, yeah, those are the sources that that I would recommend. Fantastic. Julia, thank you very much. I will be also linking those in the description below. And yeah, thanks again for, for joining us. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. Glad to be here. Check out the description below for a lot of helpful links, including how to support this sort of content. Big thank you here to patrons and channel members who make this happen. And as always, have a great day and see you in the sky.